just to get a quick overview, who has never heard of consistent hashing? Don't be shy. <laughs> All right. Um, OK, so I hope this will be at least informative. Um, a quick introduction about myself. You can find me about almost everywhere as uh, Ultrabug. I work at Numberly. We are uh, for the first time sponsors of uh, PyCon uh, FR, so we are very pleased uh, to, to, to contribute uh, in this event. We've been for a few years uh, sponsors of uh, EuroPython. So actually I've gave this talk a, a previous version of it at uh, EuroPython of the last year. Um, numberly we do, we are in the MarTech, which is a contraction between marketing and technology. So we are marketing technologists. So we use a lot of Python code actually um, to analyze data and make sense out of a lot of various types of data for to connect the brand with a customer or someone or some some people. So we sit in between um, brands and you us. And our core uh, business is data analysis and counseling our clients to make good marketing uh, strategies, and we operate them. I'm also in the open source world. I'm also a Gentoo Linux developer. Who knows Gentoo Linux? Yay! So yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I'm ultra bug there as well. Uh, I focus mainly on clustering packages, um, distributed databases, uh, packaging, and stuff like that, and, and various Python-related uh, packaging. So it's my excuse to actually go deeper into, into some open source projects and contribute to them as well. So if I can fit this with my day-to-day -day work, I'm a happy man. All right. A bit of history first. Um, I will try not to look a bit, uh, but uh, I guess I will have to sometimes. So, so forgive me. There is also a part where I will do. A, I will try to to show you a live demo. Um, it's local, so it's a, It should it should go it should go pretty good. So consistent hashing is nothing new. It goes back to Akamai. In, uh, it's a paper from Akamai uh, in 1997. So it's more than 10 years old, actually. Uh, so there's nothing new in this. Um, then it spread to peer-to-peer -peer networks like uh, Chord, uh, where they use uh, consistent hashing to keep track of, uh, of what's where uh, in, the, in the P2P. Um, Amazon DynamoDB uses it and, uh, for memory management. And basically, a lot of distributed databases, when you need to distribute something based on a key, and we'll look at why later. Um, so there are a lot of, of technologies, and very big technologies, such as Cassandra, of course, uh, which uses it uh, under the hood. But it's still fairly unknown to the casual developers. Um, so this is my time in trying to spread a bit the world in making, uh, making something out of it on actual Python code. Um, so before we go into the how consistent hashing, we need to understand the why. Why, why did this guy do this? And, and what's the philosophy or at least the basic principles behind it? Um, and it's a bit of a story about mapping. Okay, a map is a way to take something that can point to another item and, rep and return this second item. So it's how do I find this based on what you can see as a query or like we, or we use to say, or we say more a key. Um, so it's basically a referential. You have a sort of reference and you do a lookup and you get pointed to this information uh, which you can either insert because you want to put it somewhere or you want to return. Um, so it's reference information. It's a mapping between the, the two. And what is interesting us today is the arrow in between. How do you make this and what are the implications in, in this, in this uh, lookup? The comparison is a phone book. 
a phone book is just like a mapping. You go look for a name and you get a number. Right? It's pretty, it's pretty easy. So the principle, you have a referential selection. You have to have a way to find, to, 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 to define your, your reference. Then you apply a logical operation. If in the phone book, the logical operation is a physical one. You just go over the pages and find something. And then you get your information. And in between the two first steps, define your lookup efficiency. Is it efficient or not? For instance, if you take the phone book, you open a page, let's say at random, oh, I am at F and I'm looking for someone with a, a G in his name. Okay, I have to go page by page until I get something. So what we did we do to increase this lookup efficiency? Index. So you go on the index, you find the right thing, and then you go to the right page immediately. It's faster because the index is, is more dense than the actual, phone book, the, the actual phone book, right? We will get back to this index uh, idea uh, a bit later. Um, especially uh, when we'll talk about uh, Python 3.6 uh, uh, dict optimization. But basically, what you seek is the lookup efficiency when, you, when using a map. Okay, so a map, you have a key, you get a value or you set a value. Does it ring a bell? <coughs> Python dict. You address it by a key, either to set a value or to get it, right? So the representation is this with the moustache brackets, but basically it's, uh, it's, uh, it's that. I don't know if this is if it's the right term or not. Uh, anyway, actually, maybe a lot of you know and maybe some don't, uh, but the Python dict is actually what we call a hash table. So the hash table comes from the implementation of the arrow. How does it work? How does it know where to store this value from in memory? And how does it know to how to retrieve it? And it looks like this. The, the hash table is just an implementation where you hash, you apply a hash function to a key, then you apply a logical operation and that you get a pointer to a location again. It's the implementation uh, process on the, on, the, on, the, on the two parts, uh, the two first parts that define the efficiency of, of the lookup and of your implementation. So if we look at Python dict, it's using an array um, whose indexes, so the array is in memory, that's the part on your right, and the indexes of this array are obtained using a hash function on the key to store and look up the value. So there is a, a built-in function that's called hash. So when you do uh, my dict uh, uh, brackets uh, username, you actually, under the hood, you do a hash of the string username. And then the logical operation that is applied is a modulo. And the modulo is the size of the array minus one. So there is this space in memory that is segmented as an array. I have a, a key that says A. I apply a hash on it. It gives me a number. This hash function returns a number. I do a modulo on the size of the array. Let's say in this, in this case, my array in memory is, uh, is, uh, is um, is uh, an 11 element uh, array, and I get zero. That means that I will put this value, or I will get this value in memory, my index, just like in the phone book, is zero, and that's where the, the, the data is for the A key. Sounds good? Nobody's lost? All right. So, for now, let's say it's, uh, it's, uh, it's doing good. 
the, the role of the hash function is to distribute the keys evenly in the memory. So they don't, you, 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 you have to spread it. You, don't have, you, you need to be able to not have them all sequentially because good hash functions, they minimize the number of, of, of keys having the same hash. When you apply a hash, depending on your hash function, in this case, the, the Python hash is a, is a bit dumb, let's say. And that means that when you do hash of A, it gives you a number, but maybe a hash of something else, of another string, gives you the same number. When you do this, and the hash function allows this, then it's called collisions. So in our case, this is the case for the hash function in Python. So that means that two keys could point to the same index in memory. That's a problem. That means that the, the, the interpreter has some kind of logic to avoid this, to detect this and avoid this, which adds complexity and, of course, inefficiency in the process. Let's see why. So the hash gives you an uneven distribution of your keys. Then <coughs> this implementation is done because on Python, this is a bias that is known. When they know that they will have two keys pointing to the same, um, to the same index, they have, a, they have what they call a probing, which is something that will automatically resize the array in memory. But what does that mean? It means that this array is already created and will evolve over time. And when the, it does, that means that it will create cells that will represent empty spaces in memory. So this probing mechanism, because the hash function can have collisions, you get empty slots in memory. That's memory inefficient. What's good on the other side is that this implementation with the modulo has a constant lookup time. Okay, it's, it's O1. So it's optimized. That means that this implementation is optimized for fast lookups at the expense of memory. So you will get a consistently fast lookup, but you will consume more memory. That's how it is in Python. I do an aparté. I don't know the, the English word for this. I'm sorry. But it's true before Python 3.6. This chunking of the, the array in memory, it will happen when you insert or when you remove data. OK, so it will, it will, it will move over time. So what did they do in Python 3.6? Actually, the ID com is, is um, six years old, I think. Yeah. In 2012, it was proposed, and it got implemented only in Python 3.6. Well, they basically did the same thing as the phone book. So instead of having one array in memory that stores indexes, let's say, and the value of the data, they created an index array that behaves the same as before. So it will have empty slots. It still has this because the implementation itself has not changed. It's still the same hash function and it's still the same modulo. But it's more memo but you heard, I guess, maybe some of you heard that it's more memory efficient. And it is, because instead of having to probe and resize the whole array with all the data inside, it only has to resize an indexed, so it's still sparse, but it's smaller. So it's faster to do this like this. When you go on t into the indices array, you get pointed to the data array that is sorted, but that is not sparse. 
it is compact this time. So the values, they are stored in a compact way. And you just have to manipulate a smaller array of indices. And this makes the Python 3.6 more memory efficient, even if it's not perfect, because you still have the probing, you still have the same logic. It's just that you added the index, just like in the phone book. What's interesting as well is with this implementation, when you iterate over all the values of your dict, let's say, you do it directly on the data array. So before you had to do it on the only array that you had, that means that you iterated between every uh, cell of the array, and when those were empty, because it was a sparse array, you just keep them, but you still had to look up. So this is also giving performance benefits when iterating your data. It's not only lookup and, uh, and memory efficient, it's also performance efficiency here. So it's pretty interesting, but the general idea is you have an implementation, you have to ho have a way to... So I'm yeah. just wondering, how is the data sorted? Is it by insertion or is it by alphabetical order? What kind of sort is that? That's a good question. I don't know. I think I think it's insertion order. It's order. Insertion order. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's all for 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 this. But at the end of the day, whatever optimized hash table you use, you still end up with some limitation. We are still within a single machine here, right? So what if your data set is so large? that you can't store it even in the Python 3.6 uh, better memory uh, optimized implementation. <laughs> Maybe. Okay, so it doesn't scale, basically. Okay, so now we go to the distributed hash tables. So we started with a hash table, HT, and now we go to the DHT world, distributed hash tables. The principle is the same, almost. You still have, so it's hash tables, right? So you, you have to apply a hash function. It's still based on the logic of I apply a hash function, I do some kind of operation, and then something happens. But then you can split your key space in buckets. So the hash function, it will impact yeah, the size of each bucket because the hash function gives you an int. It gives you a number. So depending on the hash function you use, it could go from, I don't know, uh, minus one million to plus one million. And you have a consistent range, okay? So depending on the hash functions, you can have wider or shorter ranges. So when you want to distribute them, you have to know these ranges so you can split them efficiently. The smaller the range, the, the, high, the highest probability you have to have collisions, of course. When you have those buckets, instead of the, having them all in a single machine, you put all those buckets in different servers, right? <coughs> now, the key question in here is, what's the, 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 the orange operator? What's the best operator to apply um, to find the server hosting the key? So to find the server that owns the bucket where the data for my key is. Yeah. This is the key question. Sans jeu de mots. A naive DHT, yeah, thank you. A naive DHT implementation. The naive one, let's just do basically the same as Python does, right? So I do, I use uh, MD5. Okay, MD5 is, gives me a, a, a good distribution. It's simple, it's widespread. You can apply it on uh, almost anything, so you will get, um, 
you will get a string back, but you can then convert it to int, and then you can use this, all right? And then let's do a modulo operation on the number of buckets I have. So if I take the D, the first one, I, let's do MD5 of D, XDGest on in the uh, fifth, uh, 16, so that means that basically converts uh, uh, MD5 to, to, to integer. Uh, modulo, I have three servers, that means zero. Okay, I will go to the server in index zero. So my first server holds this key. And I can apply it to different, so E would be on the server one and F would be on server two. Great. I mean, looks solid. It works. The MD5 mixes well. Okay, so the hash of A will not be uh, close to the hash of B, necessarily close to the hash of B. Okay, that's the role of the hash function, distributing the keys so that you don't have hotspots because you have a lot of, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, E's and uh, uh, fewer Z uh, in your in your data set. It will <coughs> mix them. Okay. Well, it will work until you start adding or removing nodes. Because then the modulo on the number of buckets changes. And then if you apply the same logic, now we, the modulo is 4 for the letter D, and you see that before it was on server 0, and now it points to server 1. So because I added a server, all my pointers, or a lot, or vast majority of my pointers, of my data, is not at the good location anymore. This is the big problem. So that means that if you do this, you will have to figure a way, to implement a way to remap, we call this remapping, all your keys. Okay, so you basically need to know your key space and then iterate over it and do the before it was on this and now it is on that. And okay, I'm gonna move the data. You actually have some kind of some databases that were doing this in the first place. So imagine when the node is down as well. That's another problem. So this remapping, it will take time, it will consume I.O. and CPU. So it's not very efficient. And just because you changed one thing in your topology, all your data. This is the, the equation. N is the number of servers, basically, that you have. So when it changes, when you change this, this is the, act, the average, the, 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 the general ID of the number of keys that you will have to change. It depends on your hash functions, etc. But basically, this is it for MD5. So that means that if you had 1,000 keys on 10 servers, if only one of them servers changed, or you wanted to add one or, one or remove one, you will have to remap 900 of them. Sounds bad? Yeah. Sounds bad enough? Okay. So, yeah. That means that we need a bit more consistency in this logic, uh, because this is bad, and we can't have bad. Or, yeah, at least the best we can do. <laughs> Maybe not the perfect, but at least better, right? Okay. Uh, here comes the hash ring. Yeah, and I'm, I'm starting to feel happy in this presentation now because I'm gonna speak about some truth. Okay, so let's picture again this array where our data lives in, right? Now let's curve it to make a round and sort of infinite circle, right? So you have your nice array with all those cells in it, but instead of having it flat, you just make it a, a circle. This is the range circle, okay? This circle basically starts from the minus of what is of your hash function range 
So let's say in, in our previous example, minus one million. And the last one, and you go on the, on the ring, and then you get at the last cell, and it would be one million, let's say. This is your token range. This is the range of all, whatever you apply, you, you feed in the key, you will get within these bounds. But imagine that they just circle over and over. So now I have three servers. So I will apply the hash function on the name, let's say the name of those servers. I will get a number and I will put them on the circle at, in the right cell corresponding to the number, the token number. Right? It gives you this. So you have hash of server zero, that is the, the, the yellow one. Maybe it points to the, 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 the side of the, on the right and server two is the, is the green one and server, and, uh, server uh, one is the, 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 um, the purple one. Since it's a range, it's just like a sorted list, right? You start at w minus one million and you, and, and you just, it's, uh, it's just like an, uh, a real range, actually. It's actually a real range. Now we placed our servers on the ring. Now you come with a key. You apply the same logic. <coughs> you do the hash of your key, you get the number, you place the number, it gives you a point on the circle. You place it, let's say hash of key here in orange, and then you go clockwise on your, to know where this key belongs, to which server this key belongs, so where is it stored, you just go on the circle until you hit your first server. Just as simple as that, right? So in this case, hash of key points to server zero. That means that server zero is responsible for this key. Actually, if you look at it, and we'll see it uh, on, the next, on the next slide, but that means that each, each server is responsible for a range of the circle that we call continuum, right? It's the range before him in the loop, in the circle until you hit zero, right? And another hash of key could point there and then it would be server two. You just go, you just go clockwise, I mean. Is it easy enough to reason with? Nobody's lost? Okay. It's indeed pretty easy. Just by doing this, if you apply again and you add a server, now one over n keys only will be remapped when you do this. So yes, you will still have to handle remapping, but a, less lot, a, less more, uh, a lot less. Thank you. That means that the highest is n is, the lower impact it will have in adding or removing a server. So the more you have servers, let's say, if you lose one or you add one, you will have less and less keys to, to move. So it's pretty cool. But there's a little catch. It's only true when your keys are evenly distributed between your servers, which, and the distribution is, relies on the, let's say, purity or strongness of the hash function, because this is the hash function that distributes well or not your, your, your data. So, consistent hashing, this is consistent hashing, and it only helps in remapping, in the remapping problem. It doesn't help in the distribution. This is the responsibility of the hash function. It has nothing to do with the circle logic or the, the continuum logic. What's the problem between these? 
this distribution is the, this example exactly. You could have server zero that has a big range or a bigger range than the others. Just because the hash pointed somewhere, that makes this kind of, of thing happen. So we see that, let's say, hash server, uh, uh, server zero is responsible for a very, very large, uh, uh, a larger uh, token range than the others. If you relate the token range with the load, the actual load, that means that you get what we call load variance. It will vary between servers. So the best, uh, the, the better your hash function is, the lower it should, uh, it, should, uh, it should do this. But it's not only about the hash function. There are things to mitigate this. But we can see here that if we lose server zero, it will have a bigger impact than if we lose, let's say, server one. It's not good. So this is called hotspots, okay? Because a lot, you, you will have a, a server that is hotter than the others. What hash function to use? You have two kinds, um, the, the cryptographic ones, like MD5, SHA, and et cetera. Those ones those one are meant for, and they were designed for the cryptography. And you have non-cryptographic hash functions like uh, uh, city hash or murmur. Um, I did a quick benchmark. It's not to be written on stone, but basically it's uh, usually the, the, the non-cryptographic are, are simpler implement implementations, so they are faster. So depending on what you want to optimize, I advise you to go to non-cryptographic hash functions because you will, they will be faster. Cassandra, for example, this is distributed database, it uses Murmur v3 hash function to distribute the data between the, 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 between the nodes and to know where or which node to ask for this kind of data when you do a query, right? This is how it, it's done. They use consistent hashing, <coughs> so the methodology, and then they use the Murmur v3 hash function. Uh, the cryptographic, yeah, usually they are widespread, uh, like MD5, it's a, it's a de facto one that you, you, you have in the, in the Python standard libraries. Uh, the other ones are usually uh, requiring some kind of, uh, of C binding to, to be used. So it really depends on what you want. Uh, if you don't know and you want to start somewhere, just use MD5. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it distributes the data well and it's fast, which is okay. And usually you don't care that is now it has been broken down, so it's fine. Even just for the use case, it's, it's, it's good. So this load variance that is caused by the hash function, it can be mitigated, and I promised you to explain you why. There is two concepts. The first one is the concept of v-nodes, and the second one is the, is the concept of weight. Basically, the v-nodes is, okay, I have one server or three server, but instead, let's say, Let's pretend that instead of putting only three points on the ring, <coughs> I will just put, duplicate them virtually. And for if each server, I will put, let's say, 60 points on the, ser on the, on the nodes, on the, on, the, on the ring, sorry. So if, it's, if you, you hash the, the, the server name, you, you hash dash one, dash two, dash three, dash four, etc and you get different points of the same server on the ring. And you do this for every server. You get something that looks like this. When you do this, you see that the range, the total range is now spread in small sli smaller slices. So each server is still responsible for basically a better balanced portions of the ring. So you don't have to have thousands of servers. You have just to use vNode. Cool. And then you have this notion of weight. So instead of having a flat, let's say 60 nodes, so 60 points uh, per uh, server on the ring, let's say this server is twice as performant as the other. So you should have, you could have a weight, a way to weight 
I don't know to say it good, but uh, you can have a weight on, on the on the on the server. So this one would get twice uh, twice the number of points, which will lead to a bigger representation of the on the ring. So you will have a big uh, 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 more share of uh, of the ring, and because it can hold it. This is done as well by uh, by. Um, by some kind of by some databases, so it's pretty it's pretty it's pretty good. So when you do this, you can really mitigate hotspots very easily without thinking about it, and it still works exactly the same. You still hash your key and you get on the on the server. You just don't have to go <laughs> into into a larger a large portion of the of the ring. Okay. So now you want it in your Python code because you're so you you, you understand why it's uh, why it's good why it's efficient and uh, and uh, and but you are still like okay how do I use it and what are the Python ecosystem around this well when I needed it uh, for a production environment and numberly uh, I looked at what was there. Basically, it looked like this: uh, consistent hash ring. Okay, there were some some libraries around, but they were mostly um, proof of concepts. Let's say. So they were intellectually valid, but they were not meant or not easy to use. So I decided to create U hash ring to 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 mitigate this and to. To, take, to, to just answer my needs, my actual needs in production. Because I want to use this, I, just, I, do, I don't want to just have a ring and be able to do, uh, okay, uh, get me the node for this key and then have to implement all the logic around it. I just want to, to be able to use the, the, the ring uh, easily. This is where I'm gonna try to, to show you a, a, a bit of how it looks like. Uh, I hope it will work fairly easily as it should. Let's go there. Okay. You go you see good? Yeah? All right. Yeah, 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 it's fine. I I, I don't I don't really uh Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, where am I? Oh shit. Okay. And. Ah. Ça saute là. Shit, et là C'est bon. C'est bon. Okay. So basically, you do you hash ring, you get a, you you get a, a hash ring object. Then, uh, in this case, I will expl I will just show. Uh, let's say I have um, I have to load back. I have four disks, and I want to spread the I/O on those disks between a key. So for let's say for I don't know. Whatever it can be, I, I, I just want to make sure that when I get some kind of data for this user, it always goes on this commit log. All right. So this one I just copy past. So you create a node mapping. Uh, you 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 give them names, and then you can point appoint them instances so when it's a, it's a it's a keyword, and then it can be any kind of object. So in this case, I just create, um, uh, I just open in, uh, in append mode some files in different folders. And if you pretend that those folders were mounted on different disks, then you would spread the I.O. when you write to them differently, right? Okay, and then I just create a hash ring with this node's configuration. That's all. 
So those instances, they could point to, let's say, in this is a, a case that I explained later, but it can be a SQLite uh, databases. Okay, because you are fed up with the, 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 the one thread limitation of SQLite and you want to, 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 to be able to have all the data for a user on a SQLite file, but uh, you don't want to, you have to scale it at some point. So you could have multiple ones uh, and have a code that is able to just know which one to use and then you could spread and, o o over and over. Okay, usually you won't do it in a real production system, but it's just to get the idea that you can have anything, okay, a Redis connection, uh, whatever it is, either object. And okay, so then you get uh, your nodes, uh, which is exactly, but in, in here you see that the instance is actually the object, so in this case it's a, a textile wrapper. And then you can start saying, okay, get me the nodes for C, okay, C would be written on this one. Cool. Um, and it's cool, but this, do the other libraries, they do as well. So what I wanted best is to, to do something like, okay, but um, HR of Coco. Ah, now this one represents the actual object, the instance object. <coughs> So now I can start using it with my key, um, let's say magically, without, without thinking. So I could do that, okay, so I want to write something in it, right? Cool, it works. So now I don't have to know where to go, I just use them with the key in it as input on my ring and I, it, I just get pointed to the right instance, cool. And that means that I can flush it, and then uh, I can do with uh, open this self. Mm, yep, I should be good. And I get what I wanted. All right? So this is practical. To me, it looks practical, and this is the kind of thing I needed to distribute some, uh, some different workloads uh, in a consistent way. All right. So I'm gonna start switching back if it works. Okay, it does. Looks like it does. Okay. So example use case, database distribution. You have a database that is not able to, to distribute itself. So you just want to have different pointers and just use them, etc. If one of the database goes down, that means that you have a certain portion of your keys of your users that are affected, but not the others. And you can scale it, fine, okay. It's a cheap way, but in some case, in so, sometimes you have some legacy systems to work with and you want to work with them in a consistent way. This can be, this can be okay, be valid. So it looks a bit the same, so you, as you see the instance is a, in this case a pi and pi MySQL uh, connection and that's all. And then you can, you can use it seamlessly. The, the, the real idea about uhashing is to use it seamlessly, so in a Pythonic way. You can have this Cayo distribution, this is the one I, I showed you uh, a, a bit before. You can have a log and tracing, this one I find, I find interesting as well. This is the actual uh, kind of use case that we, that we did when you have to be able to trace all the things that a user has done and you want to make sure that all those tracing or all those metrics are stored in the same, at the same place, right? But when you have so many users and so many, so many load, uh, you need to distribute this, but still have the consistency per user. This helps. Who uses memcached and the Python memcache? Python memcache li li library? Okay. Then maybe what you don't know is you can specify multiple cache servers to uh, the Python memcache uh, library. Yeah? It uses the modulo operation to store and retrieve cache and to retrieve keys or elements uh, 
in your, in, in, of your data. So if one of your cache servers goes down, you basically lose almost all your keys and then you have to refetch it. So if this happens and you have this in production and it's big, you will have a thunderstorm of, uh, of, of load if one of your hash, uh, cache server goes down. So beware. So the U in U-Hash ring, I provide a monkey patching for Python memcache uh, so that under the hood, it uses a consistent hash ring for you. You just you can use it like this way. That's all for me. Uh, I think we have time for questions, I hope. And that's it. Thank you. One is uh, how do you usually deal with uh, not destruction because scaling up is obviously remapping a part of the, of the stuff. Scaling down may be a bit tricky because you need to have duplication if it's not a clean uh, shutdown. Yeah. And is there some ways you know of uh, you know of that we can use something out of Python maybe to delegate uh, this consistent hashing, storing, scaling up and down out of Python maybe. A database. A Don't forget ah. to repeat the question, please. Thank you, Joachim. You're right. So the question is, since it's uh, let's say a burden to implement it, uh, even more when you when you when you shrink your 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 your, your pool. Thank you. How do you ca how can you handle it outside of Python, if you don't want to handle it in Python? The best, the best that I can propose is just to use a, a distributed database <coughs> that implements it for you. But that's, uh, that's how I would do it. I, I have no magic. But with this, you can mitigate this, but you still have to do the remapping at some point. So even if you use a hash ring, you, you can use the hash ring and consistent hashing to also have a replication. Okay, so you are you can replication maybe in some you can have a replication, but so so it's good, it's it's valid enough, let's say, but that means that if you it doesn't track for you if something is unreplicated, for example, so you there is still some kind of remapping or <coughs> recloning or repartitioning that you have to do. But if you think of a way and you want to implement it in your hash ring. Namaste. You have another question? Uh, you said you had two, maybe? Two questions? Oh, well, the one okay. one was scaling down, and the second one was how to okay. standardize this. Have you looked at um, mainline DHT, where they use uh, like a multidimensional space and they compute the destination server? Uh, using a XOR between the hmm. hash of the key and the hash of the server, giving like a, a virtual instance in this multidimensional space. Have you looked at it and what do you think about it? And the question. So the question is, did I look at the, how did you, mainline DHT, mainline DHT uh, implementation and how they do it with a XOR? Yeah. Yes and no. Okay. <laughs> yes, I tried, I, I started looking at it and I was like, Blah. Uh, <laughs> so maybe, uh, I don't know. I, um, it's okay. Okay, I think we have time for a last question, maybe. Mother then it's mine. Okay. Who knows about consistent hashing now? <laughs> <laughs> ah, thank you very much. Have a nice day, thank you.